For I find it to be a law that when I want to do good, evil lies close at hand. I know this to be true. I know that there's a difference between knowing what is right and doing what is right. And you know how I know that? Because I have tried every diet known to man. <laughs> I now know so much about nutrition that I could pass a license and become a licensed nutritionist. And yet, I still reach for the cookies and the cake and the french fries and the beer. I still like all the bad things. I know what's right, but I can't seem to do it. I have an inner critic in my mind that then assaults me because of this. It just torments me with this critical, you're never going to do it right. Do you ever have that voice? Did anyone grow up with that voice? Sometimes it comes from, yes, sometimes it comes from a parent who was never satisfied, but sometimes it wasn't a parent at all, it's just in there telling us we're not smart enough, we're not good enough, we're not you know, wise enough, we're not holy enough, we're not thin enough, we're not good looking enough, you know, you name it. There's that little voice, that tape that just goes round and round. Criticism is, uh, I mean, it's got to be an Olympic type sport, right? <laughs> and there's not just self-criticism, there's also criticism of others. In seminary, we uh, sat in uh, pews that were facing each other. We, we have church in the round here, but imagine that you are all facing each other across the chapel. And seminarians made religion a competitive sport. <laughs> who's better at uh, classes? Who's, who's in chapel more often? Who's singing the right way, right? So we called those the seats of the scornful because <laughs> we would look across the chapel and say, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like that other seminarian who's much, much worse than I am. We were critical of each other, and I think that's something we also struggle with. We take in criticism from others, and then we dish it out. Think of Jesus, who is trying to get across an invitation to the kingdom of God to everybody. And he says, you know, you people, I can't win with you people, right? You are like the children who sit in the marketplace and say, you didn't dance to my tune. He says, John the Baptist came and he didn't drink. He lived like a Nazarite. If you remember the story of Samson in the Old Testament, he didn't, he didn't cut his hair. He ate locusts and wild honey, right? He, he fasted and he prayed and he stayed away from alcohol. And you called him a nut job. You made fun of him. Look at that crazy man out by the Jordan. Then I came, he said, and I ate and I drank. And you said, look, a glutton and a drunkard. With some people, you just can't win, right? And I think there is something about that. There's something about our human nature which would rather sit in criticism than join and become a participant. It's like the difference between knowing something and doing something. It's so tempting to be a critic. It's so tempting to sit in judgment of other people. You go to a restaurant, well that's, you know, you'll find fault with everything. You, I criticize how other people drive. Perhaps, well, other people criticize how I dress, I'm sure. <laughs> right, there's always something to criticize. There's always a way that we can step out of the picture and look down on others. But Jesus said this is not the secret to following. This is not the way to be a disciple. You're not gonna be able to sit back in criticism if you want to follow me, you got to participate. You got to join in. You've got to take up my yoke and follow me. You got to take up my yoke. So when I think of a yoke, I think of oxen, right? Think of that big wooden yoke with that curved part. Put it over the oxen's back there over the neck, and they can carry anything, right? They can lead a plow. They can lead a big wagon. They can carry tons of stuff. But the other thing I notice is that oxen rarely do this alone. Usually there is a team, right, of oxen, and often they are two by two. There's two at a minimum carrying that load. And so the good news for me in our scriptures today is that when Jesus says, take up my yoke, he says, my yoke is easy. Did you catch that? Yoke is not easy, it's heavy. But guess what? We are not alone. 
when we participate, when we dare to follow Jesus, when we dare to give up our role as outside critics and become participants in the reign of God, something amazing happens. We take on the yoke, but we find it to be light because who is with us? Who is the other ox? It's Jesus, right? Now, my wife was sharing with me an insight that I had never heard before, that in any team of oxen, one is the leader and one is the follower. It takes one ox to kind of push the, the uh, cart in the right direction. And the amazing thing as I think about that is we can be the leader. We can drag Jesus wherever we go. We can take Jesus in all the wrong directions and he will stay with us. He will go with us in the wrong direction to wherever we end up, whatever miserable uh, furrow that we've made in the wrong direction. But it's a lot easier if Jesus is the leader. It's a lot easier, it's a lot lighter if we're the ox that follows. And so part of our journey of participating in the reign of God, part of our journey of following Jesus and being a disciple is to allow Jesus to lead us. Every week we look up as we leave the church and we see that sign, the servant's entrance, right? Think of that as the yoke. When we walk through those doors, we're taking on that yoke, that identity as servants of Jesus Christ, servants of Jesus' world, servants of God's reign of peace and justice and love. When we put on that yoke, we are taking on the obligation to serve, but we do so with a certain lightness of spirit, knowing that we are not responsible for everything. We're not in charge of everything. We are following the, the Jesus who's yoked next to us, who is leading us to pastures of abundance, right? Still waters, abundant fields, uh, the oil that overflows. That's the journey that we have. So uh, there's some young people here today, any, and maybe some young at heart people. Anybody see the movie Ratatouille? Do you remember that movie? Did you see Ratatouille? You remember the story? So it's about a rat who is gifted unusually with an amazing palate, the ability to not only enjoy food but to cook food, but he's a rat. They don't let rats in kitchens, at least not very often. And so he finds a, <laughs> he finds a, a, a co-worker, a, a very inept uh, cook in the kitchen, and he works with him, right? He, remember he pulls his hair to get him to go the right way and to cook food? Have you seen that? Well, there's another character in that movie, and it's the one I'm thinking of, and that is Anton. Do you remember Anton, the food critic? who's kind of the, the evil guy in the story. Anton is never happy with anything. He's always super critical. He delights in destroying chefs and restaurants with his criticism of them. But then Anton tries Remy's food. He doesn't know he's a rat. And he's amazed. The dish is ratatouille, a humble peasant dish of vegetables that are transformed into this amazing uh, dish by uh, Remy the rat. Something amazing happens to Anton. When he experiences that, and there's a whole bit of plot, I won't go through the whole movie, but you know, they don't let rats in kitchens for a reason. Um, <laughs> but eventually, Anton decides to quit being a critic. He's not going to be a critic anymore. He's going to buy in to Remy and Remy's friend's new restaurant. He's gonna literally buy in. He's going to become a participant and not a critic. He's gonna take up the yoke <laughs> in a way and be part of the solution. And I think that's an invitation for us as well. As much as we are tempted to stay on the outside criticizing, in the end, what brings us fulfillment and joy, what leads us into the fullness of God's kingdom is our ability to lay aside that criticism and to tune out the inner criticism that we have accepted from others and from ourselves and to say, I don't 
care. Yes, I may be inept, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to take up that yoke because I'm not in charge. And when I follow Jesus, when I walk through the servant's entrance, when I take on the yoke that he has given me, with Jesus by my side, I can accomplish anything with God's help and power and grace. I believe that criticism leads to death. Our self-criticism, the acceptance of criticism, from, you know, criticism in a, in a positive way can be a good thing if it's offered in love for constructive purposes, right? We have to say that. Criticism is not always bad. Part of our journey is to learn to accept the right kind of criticism. But I'm talking about the criticism that is destructive, the criticism that gets in our head, what Brene Brown talks about in shame, right, where we, we internalize this and we, we have this narrative where we're no good, where we're worthless, where we're useless, right? That narrative of criticism is deadly. And it's deadly when we take it, and it's deadly when we dish it out. And what God intends for us instead is to join together, to encourage one another, to accept the leadership of Jesus Christ, to follow him into that realm of peace and justice and love and joy and abundance, to become participants, full participants in God's reign. May that be our journey. Amen.